Salesforce built its fortune by disrupting software as we know it. Launched at the height of the dot-com bubble, the company ushered in a new era of delivering software over the cloud, pushing legacy companies out of business. Agent Force. Now the tech giant is facing its own disruption brought on by artificial intelligence, and it's turning to Clara Shai to shape its future. I love to work on the forefront of disruption when it hasn't been figured out yet. Shai has a reputation for being one step ahead. She built the first business application on Facebook at 25 and started her own company, Hearsay Social, at 27. Now she faces her biggest task yet, transforming Salesforce into an AI leader. Seems like customer data thieves are everywhere these days. Salesforce is in the midst of a reinvention centered around artificial intelligence. It follows a rough patch coming out of the pandemic, where software demand slowed, revenue growth declined. The company, once known for turbocharged sales and timely acquisitions, faced questions about its future. But Salesforce is pivoting in a push to put autonomous AI agents at the forefront of customer interactions. That's elevated Clara Shai to the driver's seat as CEO of Salesforce AI. What did you envision when you took on this role? In the pandemic, you had this huge supply demand mismatch where you had a ton of customer service issues, especially if you were in hotels, airplane, you know, airline companies, hospitals, financial services. At the same time, that a lot of contact center reps were quitting in droves or cutting back their hours because now all of a sudden they had to take care of their children or their elderly parents sheltering in place. And so it really pushed customer service into using more AI. And so by the time ChatGPT came out in November 2022, we were ready. That cutting edge chatbot developed by OpenAI gave the world the first glimpse into the potential of generative AI launching a tech arms race. As tech companies scramble to develop their own AI products, Salesforce turned to its trove of customer data, something CEO Mark Benioff has hailed as the company's single biggest advantage. At its annual Dreamforce event in 2024, Shai spearheaded the launch of a new fleet of autonomous agents called Agent Force, with the platform allowing companies to build customized digital agents that interact directly with customers. Einstein, what do these blinking lights mean? Salesforce is touting the technology as the third wave in the AI transformation. What an agent is, is when you start to use the AI, not just for a single task, write me a sales email, summarize this call transcript, but actually an agent that can think and that can come up with a plan of action and then take action. So it's a difference between asking an AI in, in level one to write a sales email versus asking the, the agent to help you hit your number, hit your quota for the year. And then the agent figures out, okay, what are the steps that I need to take to hit the quota? It, it goes from being a single step, prescribing, almost micromanaging what the AI should do versus asking the agent to figure out what it needs to do. In many ways, Shai's always positioned herself at the forefront of change. An immigrant from Hong Kong, her family moved to Akron, Ohio at a young age. Her parents took on new careers to make ends meet. Their English wasn't great, and so we started over, and they, they did whatever odd and end jobs they could find, you know, um, shoveling snow in the driveway of our apartment complex, just whatever it took. And I think it, it taught me, you know, number one, humility, and that, you know, there's, there's no entitlement, right? It's like you do what it takes to take care of the people that you love. And um, two, it, it taught me the power of, of hard work and hustle. The rise of social media fueled that drive during Shai's first stint at Salesforce. When Facebook took off, she developed an application that allowed users to integrate their social media network with their business contacts. That same year, she wrote a best-selling book forecasting the social media revolution. At 27, she founded her company Hearsay Social, guiding financial services and insurance companies how to use social media in line with compliance and regulations. It feels like your career is all about sort of staying a step ahead. And I wonder where that drive comes from. It almost feels like you didn't want to fail in any way. You were afraid to fail. I mean, what drove you there in your 20s? I mean, I failed a lot, too. That, that's not on my resume, but I think that's been part of my learning. 
And for me, I mean, my parents gave up everything for my brother and me to come here. And so I just feel like the least I could do is, is to work hard and to seize every opportunity. And that's really how I've tried to live my life. Did you enjoy being a CEO, a founder CEO? Did, did you enjoy leading the company? You know, I, I didn't enjoy it at first. It was a very new muscle for me, and I had founded a company not to become a CEO, but because I was really passionate and had a lot of conviction around the idea that we were building. And so I found myself in this role where others had expectations of me, and I realized that I had to, I had to step up, and I had to be a leader. And it was a tremendous, painful, at times, process. Are there any parallels between what you saw back then, particularly with social media and what you're seeing today with artificial intelligence? When these big tr disruptions happen, there, there's a quote that, you know, the future's already here, it's just not evenly distributed. It's like sometimes, you know, I feel like I, I, I see, and there's a number of people here who see this future that is going to be agents everywhere, billions of agents deployed across businesses, but not everybody sees it yet. Are there lessons that you take away from how you saw that transformation unfold on the social media side to where it is today on the AI side. Yes, um, I think that the lesson is to have conviction. I, I had a lot of self-doubt the first time around and I was like, well, if, if no one else believes this is true, maybe I'm the one who's crazy. But just to have conviction and just to keep experimenting because no one knows exactly how it'll play out. But if you start to play in that general zip code and you start experimenting, eventually you'll stumble upon product market fit and then that's when the rocket ship takes off. That climb is already underway, according to some on Wall Street. Analysts at Wedbush Securities estimate AI products will add more than $4 billion to annual revenue at Salesforce. But the company faces stiff competition from Microsoft and other enterprise cloud providers. There's also the question about regulation in the absence of safety measures setting guardrails for AI models today. Well, when I look at those risks that we talk about, so much of the risk is really on the consumer side. Because on the enterprise side, you can control it more, you have trusted enterprise data, you have someone who is responsible, and frankly, you know, it's in the brand's interest to make sure that everything is, is accurate and trusted. Um, you don't have those same safeguards naturally built in on the consumer side, and so I think that's really where we need regulation, is to think about who are those bad actors how are they potentially manipulating public opinion? In the future, how many of our interactions are going to be driven by AI? I think a growing, an exponentially growing number of them. And I think it's, it's similar to asking the question maybe in, in 1998 of, in the future, how many of our interactions will be through the internet or some sort of digital medium? When you've got a machine, a system that can do what you have done for many, many years, does that mean the bar is that much higher for humans in terms of performance and what they have to bring to the table? I do. I think that every generation of technology has made humans better. And it's meant that humans can, can start at a higher level and what that may, would mean for education, especially for a lot of the, the lower income parts of the world today that where people don't have access to well-trained teachers in schools. 